Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here this morning. We're so thankful that we have the opportunity to gather for Bible study and for worship today. So good to see everyone out and about. We had a really good men's breakfast. Really appreciate everybody that cooked and made that possible. And we are looking forward to a great day of fellowship and worship here together. Uh, we do want to be in prayer for Miss Diane Wall and her family. Uh, many of you may have uh, heard about uh, the uh, difficulties that they have had, so we want to keep them in our prayers. Is there anyone else that we need to add to the prayer list this morning? All right. Well, let's have our prayer, and then we'll get into our class. Our God, we're thankful that we have been blessed with the opportunity to come here together today. We're so thankful for the privilege of worship. We pray you'll forgive all of our trespasses. Make us to live for you every day. Father, we're so thankful that we have the privilege of this church family, that we can gather together and be encouraged by one another and enjoy one another's company. We pray, Lord, that you'll continue to be merciful to us and forgive all of our sin. We pray that you'll bless Miss Diana Wall and her family during this difficult time. Father, we are so thankful that we can come to you in prayer and know that you hear our prayers, you respond to us, and that you are our constant comfort, our rock that we can depend upon you, that you shield us from all the pains of life. Father, we pray that you'll bless this great church and give us a great future together. Help us to always live for you in every way. And Father, we pray for your blessings, that as we are living in your word and sharing your word, that you'll continue to give us the increase. Father, we're so thankful for all of our young people and pray that you'll bless them, help them to grow up the way that you would have them. Father, we are coming before you now in the name of our Savior. Amen. All right, go to Philippians chapter 2. We'll pick back up with our text today. I hope that you enjoyed our little excursus uh, into some more doctrinal areas about the incarnation and the hypostatic union last week. But we'll back, uh, get back to our text specifically today. And as we get to our text, we remember that Paul is addressing a problem here at Philippi. The church was divided. And as is the case, typically, whenever there is a church division, it comes about because there are some personality conflicts. We see that personality conflicts are the cause, I believe, of maybe 80 or 90 percent of church conflict, church division. We never want to minimize the importance of doctrine. We understand that doctrinal division is uh, real, sad, and sometimes even necessary, but these personality conflicts are never necessary, and they're always sad. This is never acceptable in the life of God's people. So here, the church at Philippi is struggling with this division. They're struggling with this conflict, and the apostle wants to reunite this church. And the way he does that is to remind them of Christ, to point them back to the Redeemer, to point them to the Savior. So here in Philippians 2, we've looked for the last two weeks at how we are to have this mind or this attitude in ourselves, which also was in Christ Jesus. So Paul begins this section reminding us that there is this particular attitude or way of thinking that we are supposed to have. There is this way of looking at ourselves and looking at other people and looking at God. There is this attitude that will help us to have a unified church and help us to live a godly life. So Paul says that we are to have this mind in you which also was in Christ Jesus. That though he was in the form of God, he thought not equality with God a thing to be grasped or to fought to fight over. Number one, because he was already God, he did not have to pursue that position. You're either God or you're not. You can't stop being God and you can't start being God. Jesus is true God. So he knows who he is and he has confidence in his position. He has confidence in what he, his life is really and truly. Now this is an encouragement for all of us as we are trying to be unified together. To have a healthy self-confidence, that we are confident in who God has made us to be. We realize that we have an inherent self-worth as God's image bearers, that He has made us to be us. And because of that, we have value. We do not have to be intimidated or overrun with others because God has made us special as well. We are His 
image bearers. But at the same time, once we realize who we are, once we realize that we are God's image bearers, we realize that uh, we have a special place in the kingdom, then we are better suited to work with others who have this special place, uh, their special place in God's kingdom as well. And so the Bible says that God made, uh, that, I'm sorry, that God was there in the image of God, Christ in the image of God. He's in the form of God. And he thought not equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself, you see. He's able to humble himself because he is confident in his deity. He is confident in who he is. Now, as we're confident in who we are, we do not have to fight for position. We do not have to fight for popularity. We do not have to fight for control because we are confident in the position that God has made us to be in. So then, Jesus displays this for us perfectly, that he is not fighting for his deity. He just is God. There's nothing that anyone can do about that. But being God, he is also willing to add to his person this true human nature that the Bible here describes as taking on the form of a servant, that he was willing to be a servant even though he is true God. Now, this taking on the form of a servant, as we looked at last week, has to do with the assumption of a true human nature. So that all the things that God just can't do because he's God, he is, uh, his nature is too great to do these things that require weakness, that he is able to grow, he's able to develop, he's able to learn, he is able to have the weakness, uh, weakness in his knowledge, weakness in his power, he is able to grow tired, he is able to go through life just like we do for a purpose, for a reason. But in this here we see that he is humbling Himself, He is going through a life that is humble, a life that is difficult. Even at that time, the life that Jesus lived would have been a hard life. He was a carpenter, really a sort of a handyman of all sorts. So he is not impoverished, but he is not one of the wealthy either. He is as close to middle class, I guess, as you can get in the first century times. That's not really something that exists, but he's sort of what we would think of as being middle class for first century Jerusalem. So then, Jesus knows what it's like to go through life. That's why we read in Hebrews chapter 2 that he became like his brethren in every respect, so that he can become this merciful high priest, this merciful and sympathetic high priest. He's able to be that because he endured everything in our lives, just like we do, that he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. So then our Savior's humility is on beautiful display. Now, the application for us then is that we too need to be humble that we need to be secure as God's image bearers, and we need to be humble enough to live with people, to live with other people, so that in our self-confidence and then in our humility, we are able to model what Jesus has done for us. So we go back to our text here, and we see that even though he has humbled himself, even to the point of death, Death on the cross. Now, we don't like to humble ourselves very much. We probably have limits of things that we are willing to do. But Jesus removed all of those limits as he died in the most embarrassing, horrible way possible. You can go back to the four Gospels and see the record that they crucified him. You can go back to Psalm 22 and see exactly what that looked like, prophesied hundreds of years before the event, but you can see the physical, emotional agony that our Lord endured, how horrible an event this was. But he is here pictured in Philippians 2 as enduring this event, enduring this hardship, so that there can be a unity between God and sinful man. Now, if there can be this sacrifice on the part of Christ so that there can be unity between a holy God and sinful man, then I think we should surely be willing to sacrifice our own opinion and our own pride so that there can be union between all of us. 
I think Paul is trying to reduce this pride problem to an absurdity, to make our pride look ridiculous as he is highlighting what Jesus has done, comparing that with the rather inconsequential things that we get all sort of messed up about. All of the little uh, matters of opinion. All of the little personality conflicts that we have. He says, look at what Jesus has done. He was willing to die for you even though he is God. And here you are, sinful people, and you can't even find a way to get along with yourselves. It really is a sad situation when Christians cannot put their differences aside. Whenever Christians are continually fighting one another, fighting against one another over things that don't really matter, things that are just matters of personal pride. This is utterly ridiculous as we think about who we are. People who have been forgiven so much, immeasurably more than we could ever imagine. So we move on here, though, and we see that this way of the cross is the one that really and truly leads home. As Jesus has sacrificed himself, we see that God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So then, what we find is that the way up really is the way down. That if we're really going to be great as Christians, we need to be servants. Now this is completely countercultural for this world, in which you would have a city where about one-third of the people would be the ruling class, and the rest of the people, two-thirds, would be the servant class. They would be the slaves. No one wanted to descend into slavery, and everyone who was in slavery, everyone who was in servitude, wanted to get out. Here Jesus, though, provides us the ultimate contradiction. The one who is the highest, he's true God, accepts this life as a servant, as a slave, so that he is displaying how we can be united, but then also showing that in this humility... God will build us up. So then we see that our Savior has been given a name that is above every name. Now, anytime you look at the word name in Scripture, uh, you need to think essence. You need to think nature. You need to think the character of that person. And so the name that is above every name. He is, of course, the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is Jesus, our Savior. He is that name. He is that nature. He is that essence that is above every other name. He is the ultimate being. And He is the ultimate display of sacrifice. The ultimate display of love. He has this name that is above every name. And it's highlighted in His humility. Not in his power, not in his strength, but his greatness is highlighted in his humility. And then because of that, the Bible says that every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, of course, this is an Old Testament uh, echo again, as we see during these times of judgment that God has spoken through the prophet Zechariah, I believe, that every knee would bow to Him, that every tongue would confess that He is the Lord, that after this judgment, this is what's going to happen, that God would be glorified through this confession, through this acknowledgement of who He really is. Now, it is because of Jesus' servant nature, because of His servant life, that the Jews refused to acknowledge Him. Many of the Jews... That the Jews that did not acknowledge him wanted Jesus to be this great military leader. They wanted Jesus to liberate them from Roman oppression. But that is not the way that Jesus came. It is not Jesus' purpose. And it is not the work that Jesus rendered. Instead, he did something far greater. And he gives us this spiritual kingdom in which we are truly free. Rather than just having another a king, we are truly free with the king of kings being our king. But they wanted this great physical power. 
That's not what they received. They got something far better. But it is in what Jesus has given that we see that every knee and will bow and every tongue will ultimately confess, acknowledge that the glory of Christ, confess the name of Jesus. Now, as we have already noted, this idea of confessing Jesus on bended knee goes back to the Old Testament pictures of judgment. But here it is expanded as every knee and every tongue is involved. And I believe that this means exactly what it says. That ultimately, ultimately, in the day of judgment, everyone, everyone who has ever lived will acknowledge who Jesus is. They will acknowledge His Lordship. Now, at the day of judgment, it may be the first time that anyone's ever done that, and it will be eternally too late for them. But for us, it will just be another great confession, won't it? It will be another opportunity for us to acknowledge what we have been acknowledging all of our lives, that Jesus is, in fact, the Christ, the Son of God, and our Savior. So the question is, when are we going to make that great confession? When are we going to acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Hopefully we'll do that as soon as possible. And hopefully we'll do it at every time that is possible. To make that great confession, not only before we were baptized, but throughout the entirety of our life. To acknowledge in our words and actions. To acknowledge in our priorities. To acknowledge in the way that we live with others that Jesus is the Christ, that He is our Savior, and that He is our Lord. So our God has given Him this name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, we see how Paul is using this ancient Christian hymn to propel the Philippian church and us to unity. That instead of striving for power or position, we should really work hard at being a servant. Whenever someone has a need or whenever they think they have a need, we want to try to take care of that person because we're emulating Jesus. We're following His example. We want to outdo one another in showing honor. We want to outdo one another in showing love. We want to see others as being more important than ourselves. We want to have this attitude of service. Because it is this attitude of service that Jesus lived. And it is this attitude of service that God rewards. Not an attitude of pride. Anytime people live with this attitude of pride, especially in ministry, you will always find that they're eventually cut down. They may gain a good following from people who are on the outside that don't know them very well. But whenever you really get to know someone who's filled with pride, you can tell it. You can see it. And you can see why they're in ministry. You can see why they're doing church work. It's just another opportunity for them to have the spotlight. Just another opportunity for them to exercise control over people. And this never, ever works out well. God humbles those who are prideful, but those who are humble, He exalts. So then we have this beautiful illustration here in Philippians 2, that we are to be these people of service. So as we go on then in verse 12, Paul is still yet looking here to Philippians 2, saying, look at Jesus, and saying, since you're looking at Jesus, here's the therefore. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more so in my absence. He is telling the Philippians, this attitude of Christ is what needs to get worked out in you. This attitude of Christ is what needs to be your day-to-day -day routine. As you have always obeyed. Obeyed what? The gospel but specifically here, this attitude of humility, that we are working for others, we are here to serve others, we are not here for our own position. So he says, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more so in my absence, 
work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So then you see that we are to be at work. And the word here for work has to do with uh, the Greek word erg. There's this whole academic discussion about Paul's use of the words, these erg words uh, in his letters. But you can hear the meaning of the word erg, the Greek word erg, just in hearing it, can't you? Because whenever you have to exhort a lot of effort, what do you do? Whenever you try to get up in a little bit, what sound are you going to make? You're going to say, erg, right? Whenever the song leader wants you to stand up 40 million times in the service, you say, erg, right? Maybe under your breath a little bit, but you still say it. But here, that's the Greek word that is used, and Paul employs this word by inspiration of the Spirit to let us remember that your salvation requires work, that you are supposed to be active, that your salvation is not belief alone, but rather you are to be invested in your salvation. So as we look here at this command to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, what we find is that we have a place and we are to be involved and we are to bring our salvation to completion, that we are to be active that salvation is not something that is totally passive in nature. But because of what God has done, we cannot help but to work. One of the best ways for us to appreciate this, I think, is to look back at the idea of receiving a gift. The idea of receiving a gift. Now, the Bible declares that salvation is a gift, right? You're saved by grace, what is grace? It's a gift. You are saved by grace through faith, this not of yourselves, not of works, lest man should boast. But any time you receive a gift, what is the appropriate thing to do? You express thanks, don't you? You express thanks. And your expression of thankfulness is somewhat corresponding to the gift that you have received. Right? So if someone gives you tickets to a Vanderbilt football game, what do you do? You recognize that they're probably just trying to fill the stadium, right? They're, they're just giving them away so that people will be in the seats. So you can say thank you and go on your way, right? If someone gives you tickets to uh, the Alabama-Texas game, how much do those bad boys run you? A lot more than I'm ever going to pay, Right? That would require a bit more gratitude, wouldn't it? If someone were to give you a brand new Ford Bronco, that would require some thankfulness on your part, wouldn't it? Right? Bradley says no. <laughs> we'll pray for him. But that would require a great bit more thankfulness. Here, having received the gift of salvation, having salvation offered to you, what then should be the response? Everything. Total surrender. I am absolutely at your service. Anything you ask, I want to fulfill that request. Anything you demand, I will be there immediately. So we see this idea of receiving this gift is helpful for us to understand exactly how this relationship between salvation and our works should work, how they fit together. We have been given this, we've been offered this, and this requires then our life. There are most definitely commands in Scripture. Some of the most difficult commands are to believe and to repent. We struggle with those all the time, don't we? It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to repent. Sometimes it takes a lot of work just to believe. We're also commanded to be baptized, aren't we? If you think about it, of all the things that we are commanded to do, baptism requires the least work of all of them. Baptism is the most passive thing a Christian ever does, isn't it? What do you do? You don't do anything. 
Of course, the guy that baptized me was in his 80s, so I was hanging on for dear life. But uh, that's, a, that's a different story. Uh, but uh, baptism is not a work of man. The Bible tells us that baptism is a work of God. That we're raised through the powerful working of God. It's God who works. Baptism is not our work. It's certainly not any more of a work than believing. It's certainly not any more of a work than repenting. Living faithfully every day, even, even in ways that aren't noticed. Just living faithfully every day. Just being a regular Christian is one of the greatest things you can ever be. That requires a lot of effort, does it? It requires a lot of service, a lot of sacrifice. So then we expect to be active. To bring our salvation to completion. Work out your own salvation with fear and Trembling. This fear and trembling is this reverential awe that we have of God. Sadly, we have brought God down from His transcendent level so that He can be so relatable to us that we don't appreciate the concept of fear and trembling any longer. If you go back to the Old Testament, though, and survey God and His holiness you will see that God's holiness is displayed in the mountain that must not be touched or else you die, in the things that cannot be touched or else you die, in the places that you cannot go without special coverings of grace or else you die. So we approach God with fear and trembling because He is holy. It's only the sacrificial death and continual high priestly intercession of Christ that makes it possible for us to come boldly before the throne of grace. But even in that, we come humbly. We come humbly out of respect for the Creator of the worlds, the Creator of all, the One who spoke us into existence, and the One who could easily speak us out of existence. We come before our God with fear and trembling. So we continue to work every day as we're living every day in the face of God, in the presence of God, working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Now the next phrase is actually part of the same sentence and it cannot be left out. We emphasize the first part of verse 12 because we want to position ourselves against belief onlyism. But the next verse is there too, isn't it? For God is working in you, both to will and to work, according to His own good pleasure. The first word for work there is another one of these erg words. You're familiar with it because we made it an English word. For God is energizing you. That's the Greek word there. God is energizing you. Now, this is not all that confusing, I don't think. Sometimes we make it a bit more confusing than it really is. Jesus said, for example, Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Is that true? When Jesus is lifted up in our lives and in our preaching, are we not drawn to Him? He is this captivating character. At the very least... He is this captivating character that people cannot help but be interested in. If He's lifted up, He draws people to Himself. You see how that works? God is there and people can't help but be interested in Him. Again, we go over to the book of Titus. And we see that when the loving kindness and goodness of God our Savior appeared, what did He do? He saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration and washing of the Holy Spirit. But then He says that in this He is training us to renounce all ungodliness. How? Just by His appearance He's doing that. Just because He is there He's doing that. So then when we get back here to Philippians 2 and we see that it is God who is working in you, I think we see something similar. That God is working in you. I mean, that's what the Bible says, isn't it? Isn't that what the Bible says? That God is working in you. God is 
energizing you? Well, how does He do that? Well, I don't know. I believe that He is drawing us to Himself in who Jesus is. I believe He draws us to Himself through the Scripture. I believe He draws us to Himself in uh, what I like to think of as providential preparation, like with Lydia, whose heart was open, so that she might hear the things that were spoken by Paul. And as you will pray, probably in just a little bit, that I will have a ready recollection of the things that I have studied. How does God do that? I don't know. But you keep praying for it, right? Right? You keep praying, you'll get something out of these lessons. That kind of, it's kind of offensive, really. <laughs> Lord, help us to get something out of this. No. But you pray for those things, don't you? How do we expect God to do those things? We don't know how, but we trust that He does. Right? We don't know how, but we trust that He does. So what we find here in Philippians 2, 12 and 13 is that we most certainly do have a responsibility before God to bring our salvation to completion, to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. What we're also reminded, though, is that we are not working alone, that God is working in you, right? That God is influencing you in some way. God is working on you in some way. How is He doing it? I don't know. But what is He doing? He is working in you both to will and to work according to His good pleasure. Now that does not take away our personal responsibility. All throughout the Scripture what we find is our personal responsibility, right? Choose this day whom you will serve. Adam and Eve chose to go into sin and they re uh, reaped the benefit of that, didn't they? Individuals chose to believe in the Lord. Others chose not to believe in the Lord. There is there our personal responsibility. But there is also the reality of God working in us both to will and to work according to His own good pleasure. I think we need to help, hopefully be balanced in this. That we do not become deists. A deist is someone who believes that God set up the universe and walked away. That is most certainly not the biblical position. We also do not want to become determinists who believe that God set up the world and there's absolutely nothing that we can do that's a real choice or anything of real consequence. That's determinism and that's not in the Bible either. But what we do find is that we are real moral agents. We make real decisions. We have real responsibility before God to work out our salvation. And at the same time, God is graciously working in us to bring about His will and His good pleasure. That's an incredible mystery that we need to accept by faith. That we are thankful that God works in us. And we're also thankful that we have the opportunity to display our thanks to the gift that God has given us. All right, I preached a lot so far, so what, what insights or thoughts do you have? Nothing. I was afraid of that. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get back to our text. We get down here to verse 13. He says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work, His own good pleasure. Then in verse 14, it's a lot easier, isn't it? In verse 14, we are told something very simple. To do all things without grumbling or disputing. Well, I said it was easier, but apparently it's a lot more difficult, isn't it? How many times do we do things without grumbling or disputing? Well, any time I have to do something, I, I usually complain about it, right? I'm not so disputeful, but I, I am a bit of a grumbler. But he says, whatever you do, do all things without grumbling and without disputing. And here's why. So that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. He is comparing what Christians are supposed to be to the way that the ancient Israelites lived in the wilderness. What did they do in the wilderness? They grumbled and grumbled and grumbled. And what else? They disputed with Moses the whole time. 
It was a rather pitiful expression of people being together, wasn't it? So Paul here says that you are to do all things without grumbling or disputing. And here's what's going to happen when you do that. That it will lead to you being blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. So that instead of seeing people who are always bickering and fighting, what you find is a people who are united together in God's service. And what happens when you see such unity? They shine as lights in the world. They shine as lights in the world at the end of verse 15. And then in verse 16 he says, holding fast to the word of life. This could also be translated as not just holding on firmly, but holding forth. And that may be the idea. That you shine as lights in the world and you hold forth the word of life. What happens whenever you are grumbling and complaining and you're disputing and you're talking about your church family? What, what happens? What happens to the gospel influence? Nothing, right? I told you one of the most embarrassing things I've ever seen on TV. Y'all know I watch the History Channel a lot. Y'all remember when the Hatfield and McCoy episodes came out? Did you see them coming out of church together that one time? Did you happen to read the sign up on the building when they came out of church? There were the Hatfields and McCoys coming out of the Church of Christ. True story, by the way. But wow, that's pretty sad, isn't it? What were they known for? They weren't known for the gospel, were they? Well, that's not going to be true of us, is it? No longer will we be known as a divisive people. We will be known as the people who are united in God's truth by God's grace, for God's glory. This is who we're going to be. We will not be divisive. We will be united in Christ and for Christ so that we can hold forth the word of truth and shine as lights in this dark world to be encouraging and to be evangelistic. That's who we're going to be. Now, in order to do that, we have to have this attitude of Christ that he's been telling us about here in Philippians 2. He says, when you do that, I may be proud I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should all be glad and rejoice with me. This picture that Paul's painting in the text is that he is willing to pour himself out. He's willing to give all that he is so that this church here in Philippi will be united. That's what Jesus did, wasn't he? He gave all that he had so that we could be united to God. And in the midst of that, church, you are to be united together. As you are united to God, you are to be united together for God's glory. Now in verse 19, he continues throughout this chapter. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. Look at the way he's looking at uh, one another here. I'm sending Timothy so that I can be encouraged by you. I want to hear about you. I want to hear about your progress. I want to hear about your life, so that we are all encouraged. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. How are we supposed to be? Encouraging, encouraged by one another, encouraged by one another's welfare. He says, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus. But you know Timothy. He's not like that. He doesn't seek his own. He seeks the Lord. He seeks you. He wants to build you up. You know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. This is not just Paul telling about his travel plans, is it? He says, if you want to know how to live, you look at Jesus and I'm sending Timothy to be a reminder. Timothy doesn't live like some of you are living. He's not in it for himself. He's not in it for position. He's not in it for pride. He's not in it to control you. He's in it for the gospel. He's in it for you, to help you, to be an encouragement. So he says, I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger 
and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all. He's been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I'm the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service. See these two encouragers? Timothy, the servant. Epaphroditus, the servant. The one that you care about. The one that cares about you. All of these men are being put forth as examples of how the church is supposed to live together. How they're supposed to be unified. Well, I believe that's all of our time, so we better be dismissed.
Good morning, everyone. Glad to see you all here at the Ripley Church of Christ. We're going to sing a few songs this morning before being led in our opening prayer in Scripture. If you've got your books and want to follow along there, we're going to start in number 96, but it'll be on the screen as well. I stand in awe.
Matthew 15, 15 through 20. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Let's pray. Dear God, our Father, we're grateful for another day that you've given us, another day that we can worship. We thank you, Father, that we can come before you in prayer. We thank you, Father, for all the blessings that you give us every day. We thank you most of all that you sent your son Christ to die for our sins on the cross and give us the hope of eternal life. Father, we pray that you will be with the, those of our number who are sick. We pray that they might be uh, experience healing, that they might be back to their normal lives and be back with us uh, very soon. Father, we pray for those who have lost loved ones recently, that you will comfort them and you will strengthen them and help us to be uh, to say things and to be uh, to be there for them and to, to give them uh, strength to uh, go through this sad time. Father, we thank you for the church that meets here. We pray for those who lead us. We pray for our elders and deacons, our teachers, our song leaders. We pray for every member that we uh, can live our lives in a way that will carry your kingdom forward, that we can be a light into this uh, community where we live and our daily lives, that we can influence others for good, and that we can bring lost souls to you. Father, we thank you for Donnie and his family and Cody and his family as they work with us here. We pray that you will lead them and bless them and guide them in the things that they do. We pray that you will uh, help Donnie today, be with him as he brings the message to us, and that we can uh, be good listeners and good appliers of uh, your word, and that we can be better Christians every day. Father, we thank you for those who uh, defend our country, those in the armed forces, wherever they may be throughout the world. We thank you for those, our, our police and our firemen, 
all our first responders, all of our uh, doctors and nurses and medical personnel that watch out for us and um, protect us and help us when we're in need. Be with them and help them to be safe and, and guide them in their, their work that they do. Father, we pray that um, you will be forgiving of us. We know we fall short of what we should be. We do things we should not. We don't do things that we should. We pray that you'll forgive us and help us to be forgiving toward those who sin against us. We thank you for the gift of your son, and we pray that you will help us every day to uh, have Christ as our example and as our model that, uh, to look to uh, on how to live. Guide us always and forgive us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to take communion together, let's sing number 354. 354. I gave my life for thee. <clears throat> I gave my life for thee. I don't think that I pay much attention to a majority of the time when talking about the, the Lord's Supper is when uh, it was instituted. You read in Luke's account in chapter 22, starting in verse 14, and when the hour came, he reclined at the uh, table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have an earnest, I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Uh, the Passover being a, a feast of remembrance of uh, the tenth uh, plague upon Egypt where God passed over those who had the blood on the door. It was a feast of remembrance and something that we see throughout the Old Testament. Uh, something happened a lot, a lot of yearly feasts of remembrance. Uh, and you, you look further on in verse 19, and he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. All of these feasts, yearly feasts uh, in the Old Testament, of course we don't go by those, but we were given one uh, that we were to take every week in remembrance of the sacrifice that Christ made for us. Uh, so as we go to God in prayer, let us remember that sacrifice uh, and do it in a way that honors uh, the sacrifice that was given. Let's pray. Father, we come to you thanking you for this day, 
thanking you for this opportunity we have to come together and to worship, to worship you and to take this feast, uh, this remembrance uh, of the sacrifice that your son made on the cross. We pray that you bless this bread as we take it, uh, remembering the body that was broken on our behalf. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Father, we come to you again thanking you for this blood or this fruit of the vine that represents the blood that was shed. Thank you for uh, the cleansing that we have that is poured onto us when we are baptized. And we thank you for this opportunity to remember that sacrifice. And we pray we do so in a right manner. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Now that we have completed the Lord's Supper, let us give thanks for the blessings that we have. Father, we come to you uh, again thanking you for the material blessings that we have on this world. Uh, we thank you for all the, uh, all the financial gains that we have and help us to understand that all of that is for naught. Uh, our goal should be heaven. So as we give back a portion of, of that which is given to us, help us do so joyfully knowing that this money will be given to grow the church here and abroad. And we thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to stand, please do. We'll sing this song, Take My Life, and Let It Be, before our sermon this morning. 669, if you're following the book. <clears throat> Take my life and let it be consecrated.
last couple of years, we've probably thought more about how to wash our hands than at any point prior in our life. As we have been confronted with coronavirus and so many other things, what we have noticed is that we need to all wash our hands. Every time I say that phrase, I'm reminded of a time when I was back in college and some friends of ours went to a, a Japanese steakhouse for the very first time. Now, none of us were uh, very cultured at all, and none of us had ever been to anything like a Japanese steakhouse. And so we walk in the door, and we don't really know what's going on. We're kind of standing around looking, trying to figure out exactly what's supposed to happen. And then all of a sudden, this little lady jumps out. And I guess she sees that we're a bunch of college guys, and she looks at us, and she says, wash your hands. And so uh, I have thought of that like every day of my life since. For the last 20-something years, every time it's about time to eat, I think, wash your hands. But today, as we're thinking about being clean, what we are looking at is the ritual of washing your hands. Here in Matthew chapter 15, the focus is on how to wash, what you have to do to wash. Now, as you're washing your hands, you, of course, know that you're supposed to use soap and water. You're supposed to have your hands that are covered with soap being covered with the water for a certain amount of time. There's certain little tricks. You can sing happy birthday to yourself. One of my favorites, though, is to recite the Lord's Prayer to yourself while you are washing your hands. That's supposed to be enough time. But I want to be careful on telling you exactly what you're supposed to do when you're washing your hands here in Matthew chapter 15 because this is exactly what causes all of the trouble to begin with. Because, you know, as we are trying to wash, a lot of us like to do it our own way. Any of you who have given a sweet little bitty baby their first bath know that it's just a wonderful, glorious experience. They're cute. You can bond with them. But then they get just a little bit bigger. And when they're about three months old, they become experts at bathing. And this is about what happens, right? They're in a bucket, they're in the sink, because that's the way you wash a baby, isn't it? You put them in the sink. You put them in the sink, you're washing that baby. The baby's picking the water up, throwing it all over you, all over everything. The only thing that does not get wet is the baby. So they have their own idea. And it turns out here in Matthew chapter 15 that this is exactly the question that we're struggling with. How is it that we can be spiritually clean? And the people here in Matthew 15 want to be clean their own way. They, like this baby, want to do it their own way. They want to find their own religious expression. They want to make up some laws, some commandments that they can follow. And in keeping those laws and those commandments, they believe that they will stay clean. But as we are continuing to study here in Matthew 15, what we find out is that you can't just do it your own way. This little baby is sitting in a bucket and it's cute as all can be, but it's not going to be clean until it's washed the right way. And so Jesus here in Matthew 15 is going to help us to see and understand exactly how it is that we can be clean. And the thing that we learn here in Matthew 15 is that our cleanliness, our spiritual cleanliness is not just external. It's not just about what people see you doing and how you present yourself. But your clean, cleansing, your spiritual cleanliness, your spiritual purity, your spiritual health depends upon an internal purity as much as anything. So as we begin here in Matthew 15, we discover here the Pharisees and scribes come to Jesus from Jerusalem. Now, anytime you see the Pharisees and scribes coming to Jesus, you know that something is about to happen. The Pharisees is a group that was started in between Malachi and Matthew. They were really a religious group that was set out trying to be a reform group. They had saw, seen all of the abuses in Jerusalem, and they wanted to bring people back to Scripture, back to the pattern that God had set forth. And so led by this man named John Hyrcanus, they called themselves the Pharisees, those who were separate. Thus the Pharisees. Then you have the scribes. And the scribes are the ones who are experts at the law. 
they have employment in copying the Word of God over and over again for sale and then also for memorization for their own learning. They're supposed to be the experts on what God has said. But the danger here with being a Pharisee and a scribe is that you love the law so much that sometimes you forget about the Lord. And you love the law so much you think, man, it'd be great if I added some laws on there too. It'd be great if I put some laws on there so I can really protect the law that God has given us. Sort of like that fine china that some of us used to have in our house. That fine china that you would have up in the display case. And maybe once every couple of years you'd take it out and polish it and put it right back in there. And you'd have all of these laws about what you could and couldn't do around the display case. Well, that's what the Pharisees did. You see, they'd never take those dishes out. They'd never enjoy those dishes. Instead, they had laws keeping them away from, um, from enjoying everything, from enjoying God and enjoying God's grace, enjoying God's mercy. They had all of these laws so that nothing bad could possibly happen, or at least so they thought. So the scribes and Pharisees came to Jesus from Jerusalem, and they say, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Now here in verse 2, we have a problem highlighted for us already. They are not breaking the commandment of God. They are not breaking what God had written. Instead, they are breaking the tradition of the elders. What everyone had always said, you have to do. The way that we say this is what has to be done. They say that our people have done it this way forever. Well, what exactly is it that they're breaking? He says they're breaking the tradition of the elders, for they do not wash their hands when they eat. Whenever I read that, I can see the Pharisees like that little lady that jumped out and said, wash your hands. But here we have the Pharisees who say they're not washing their hands whenever they eat. What they mean is they're not going through this ritual of washing your hands whenever you eat. Now, here's the ritual. First of all, the ritual was not about being physically clean to eat. The ritual was about being spiritually clean so that you can receive God's blessings in food. And in order to be spiritually clean, ritually clean, to have God's food here, you have to ceremonially, ritually wash your hands. And so they're not concerned with having their hands under water to get all the dirt off. What they're doing is getting themselves ritually purified to receive God's blessings of food. And here's how they would do it. They would begin by washing this hand with this hand. But you immediately see the problem, don't you? Once you have washed this hand with this hand, you've now defiled this hand. And so you've got to take this clean hand and wash this hand. And now you've got another problem because once you've washed this pure hand with this, or you've washed this unpure hand with this pure hand, now both hands are dirty again. And so you've taken some of the filth off, but you have to take enough water, they say, enough water that would fill half an egg. That was the law. You take a water that would fill half an egg, pour it over this hand, and then you take another bit of water that would fill half an egg, and you wash this hand by pouring that water over this hand. This was their law for washing their hands. Jesus' disciples weren't doing that. It was the tradition of the elders. It's what most people expected. But it was not the law of God. It was not something that God said they had to do. But the scribes and, scribes and Pharisees expected God's people to all follow the tradition. But what they are doing really is elevating their tradition to the commandment of God. They're elevating their opinion, they're elevating their views to what God had said. Now, I believe that as Jesus is questioned about the baptism of John, we have a helpful way of deciphering what is required of us by God, and then maybe what might be expected by people. You see, they came to Jesus and asked about John's baptism, and they said that, uh, you know, why is John out there baptizing? 
And Jesus' response is this. The baptism of John, was it from heaven? Was it from God? Or was it from man? Now the people would not say that it was from man because they knew John was a prophet. They wouldn't say it was from heaven because if they said it was from heaven, they knew they had to do it. But here this test is helpful. This question of ritually washing your hands, was it from God? No. It was only of man. Therefore, you could have gone through this ceremony and been fine, but it's not necessary. It was never required by God. But the things of God are different, aren't they? When God has given us a command, that means that it is a command. It is not an option. It's not something that we can debate about. It's not something that we can say, well, I don't know, maybe someone should do this. Maybe someone else should do this, but I don't know if it's really for me. And so as the Bible commands us to sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord, that's a command. When the Bible tells us to do all things in love, that's a command. When the Bible says that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, that's a command. When the Bible says we should do all things without grumbling, complaining, that's a command. These are things that are not optional. Look at the way then that our Lord addressed this problem. They're asking about the tradition. But Jesus says, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or mother what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father or mother. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So here's the problem that the people had. They understood that the law said that they were to honor their mothers and their fathers. Now the word honor there is kin to our word honorarium. Now, in our culture, whenever you receive an honorarium, that means you've done a lot of work, and now they're going to give you a little bit of money. But in the ancient world here, an honorarium, or to honor father and mother, meant that you would take care of them in their old age, even with money if need be. That whatever they needed, you would provide as good children. You would provide for your parents in their old age. Do you hear me, my children? Okay. But this is what was happening. And so as they have this command of God, they say, I don't want to take care of my parents when they're old. So the money that, you know, maybe I could give to my parents, I'm going to say that it's Corbin. I'm going to say that it's given to God. And so I don't have to give that money to my parents. I can just wait until they're gone and then I can use that money for whatever I want. And the Lord says, you hypocrites. You have invalidated the law, one translation says. You've made the law to be nothing in the way that you are elevating your traditions above it. He calls them hypocrites. They wanted to be seen as righteous. They wanted to be seen as holy. But inside, as the Lord would later say, they were nothing but whitewashed tombs filled with dry bones. You see, here's the problem here with this tradition. These traditions help us to look holy. These traditions help us to look righteous. But these traditions do not affect what's on the inside. They make us appear to fit in with what a godly person should look like. But God does not merely want us to be a hypocrite. He does not merely want us to play the part. He wants us to be the real deal, the genuine article. And to be the real deal, the genuine article, you have to have a real spiritual cleansing. 
So Jesus goes on here in verse 14 to begin discussing what really defiles a person. He says, he called to the people to himself and he said, Hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person. But what comes out of a mouth that defiles a person? Now you can hear the Jewish people saying, what about all of the Levitical dietary laws? All the things that God said we can't eat. What do you mean it's not what goes in that defiles us? Here I believe we have a, a revelation of the purpose of the law. The law was to keep the people distinct from the pagans around them. The dietary law was there to keep the people from looking like the pagan nations around them. The dietary laws were given to keep them safe from eating things that would make them very sick. And so here the Lord is moving on past that into expecting the new law when He is saying that it's not what goes in that defiles a man, but what comes out. And the disciples came and said, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard that? Well, if you know people that are like the Pharisees, they're generally offended whenever they hear anything, aren't they? He says, Don't you know that these Pharisees were offended? And he said, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Leave them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the pit. The Lord is saying of these people who are only concerned about the external, that they are blind guides. They do not have the light of God in them. They are not God's true leaders. They are not the ones that are pointing you to true holiness. They are the ones who fall into this category that we saw in the first part of Matthew 15. They are the hypocrites. You see, they are the ones who are wanting to appear righteous. They want to appear holy. They want to look like they've washed their hands and they're ritually, spiritually pure, but what they've really done is just waste a lot of water. This is what the word hypocrite really means. The word was used by the ancient Greeks to describe some actor in a play. And as you're probably familiar, these Greek and Roman actors, as they would put on a play, you could have one actor playing several different roles. So you would have a guy, always a guy, and he would hold up a mask, and he would play one character. And then he would put that mask down, hold up another one, and he would be another character altogether. And then he would take that one down, hold up another, he could be another character altogether. You see, he didn't change. There was just a different mask that he presented to everybody else. That's what trap the Pharisees fell into. They wanted to look like something to everyone. They really and truly believed they could fool the people into thinking that they were spiritual giants. But in reality, they were just playing a part. In reality, they're just hypocrites. In reality, they're only doing the external and nothing has changed on the inside. This is a major problem in the first century for the Pharisees, and it's a major problem for us today. He says, going on there in verse 16, he says, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and it's expelled? He says, there's no spiritual quality to what you eat. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. He gives this brief list of sins, saying these sins, all sins, they come from the inside. You know, that's what really happens, isn't it? 
you, you see as these Greek uh, characters, these Greek actors are there playing their parts, eventually they have to put the mask down and go home. And that same problem affects us all, doesn't it? Eventually our public persona has to be laid aside. Eventually people will find out who we really are. They'll see if we really are trying to be a Christian or if we're just playing the part, if we're just playing the role. Eventually the truth comes out. But it's always known by God. The Bible says, even of Jesus in His incarnation, that He knows all things, the thoughts of men, and He doesn't need anyone to tell Him what's happening, even in what they were thinking. Jesus knows who you are. He knows about your sin. He knows about your temptation. He knows the real you. Not the person that you want to be seen as. Not the person that you hope people think you are. Jesus knows you. Now that's a pretty scary thing to think, isn't it? It can also be a wonderful thing to think. To know that Jesus knows me and He loves me anyway. To know that Jesus knows my struggles. He knows my temptations. He knows how I want to sin and He loves me anyway. God so loved. God loved the world in this way. That He gave His only begotten Son. So that whosoever, all you sinners... All of you who are struggling with temptation. So that whosoever would entrust their life to Him would be saved. So that they'd have eternal life. Because God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world for who they really are. He came to save them. To take who they really are and to heal their broken lives to take who we really are with all of our sin and has put us back together the way that we need to be and to hide us in His blood. That's why Jesus came. And so He says to the hypocrites, He says to the ones who want to be seen as being holy, that it's okay to confess your faults. It's good and helpful to acknowledge that you are a sinner. Jesus has shown that to us over and over again, has He? He says, the well do not need a physician, but those who are sick. That makes me glad to know that I'm a sick person. Because Jesus came for me. You remember the story that Jesus told of this man who is standing over there praying in the corner. Lord, I thank Thee that I'm not like that guy. I'm not like that guy over there. Then another one standing afar off wouldn't come near to God's house. Wouldn't come near to God's people because he felt the conviction of his own shame. Lord, forgive me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, that person went home justified because he acknowledged who he really was and he begged God he trusted that God would save him, heal him, forgive him, despite who he is. That's what it means to be saved. For someone who is broken to be healed. It makes it a lot easier to acknowledge our brokenness, doesn't it? It makes it a lot easier for us to acknowledge that we're sinners in the hands of both an angry and a loving God. Jesus says, all of these problems are coming out of your heart. What are we then going to do with our heart? We can go back to the book of Ezekiel and we can see how that God said He would take this heart of stone, this calloused heart, this heart that was filled with rebellion, 
And He would give them a heart of flesh so that they would know and keep God's law. Isn't that our prayer even today? That was the vision that God has for His church. That He would give us a new heart. A heart shaped by Christ. You see, that's what Jesus does to our hearts, is to... As we do not have to live this prideful life anymore, as we are able to come to God and say, I am broken, as we are able to look up from the depths as did Peter and say, Lord, save me. Then that heart of stone can be made into a heart of flesh. Then we will be in a place where we can hear the Word of God, we can know the Word of God, and we can do the Word of God because we're clinging to our Savior. Not out of our own righteousness, but an appeal to His. Guard your hearts by giving them to the Lord. As we continue here in verse 21, what we find is not a disconnected story. But it's really the culmination of everything we've been looking at in Matthew 15. Jesus went away from there and He withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying. Now when we run into the Canaanites in the Old Testament, you remember who they are. They're the pagans that God's people were supposed to clear out of the land. They were the ones that were so evil that God said we need to destroy all these people. But they didn't do that and so there's Canaanites left. And now we have this Canaanite woman. She is not a Jewish woman. She is one of the ancient enemies of Israel. A Canaanite woman from that region came out and she was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she's crying out after us. So they said, She's embarrassing us. She's bothering us. She's in aggravation. She's not one of us. She's a Canaanite. She's unholy. She's ritually impure. Send her away. Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before Him saying, Lord, help me. And He answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and to throw it to the little dogs. She said, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. As we look at this Canaanite woman, we can contrast her with the scribes and Pharisees. The scribes and Pharisees looked at God and said, we want to be holy. We're going to make our own law so that we can stand before God and be holy. We're going to follow the doctrines of men so that we can be right with God. Jesus says, that doesn't work. You need to be cleansed by God from the inside out. Here's an example. Look at this Canaanite woman. She didn't have anything to base her forgiveness on except she was willing to entrust herself to the Lord. This was all she had. This prayer that God would save her daughter. There was no expectation that Jesus would do this. He was a Jew. She was a Canaanite. They're bitter enemies. What did she have to depend on? What expectation should she have had except that God was merciful? The traditions of men, the way people had been doing things, that wouldn't save the girl. But entrusting your life to the Lord, crying out to Him in faith, depending on Him who saves, then we find a different story. Then we find how God washes His people. There in Titus chapter 3, the Bible says, When the kindness of God our Savior appeared, and His love for mankind appeared, He 
saved us. He took our brokenness and He saved us. Not by the works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His own mercy. Not that you can earn your place with God. Not that you can appear to be holy and God knows better. But He says, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy. And this is how. Through the washing of regeneration. Through the renewal by the Holy Spirit. In other words, here in Titus 3, when you are baptized, look at what happens when you are baptized. You are baptized because Jesus appeared. You are baptized because Jesus gave this commandment. You are baptized because you know that you can't save yourself and you have to depend upon the Lord. You know that you are far away from God and you need God to make you to be near. And so you, being afar off, you come to the Lord in faith, crying out, God, save me when you are baptized. And what does God do when you are baptized? He washes you. He regenerates you. He makes you to be born again. He renews you by the Holy Spirit so that then you are a new creature, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And you've been healed from your brokenness. You've been healed from your sin. Not because you followed the tradition of men, but because you followed the law of God. Not because you look holy to everybody around, but because God is holy and He declared you to be holy as well. So then, why not come to the Lord? without pretension, without pretending to be something that we're not, acknowledging that we all sin, and as Paul and many others said, that I am the chief of sinners. Acknowledging that we are imperfect. Acknowledging that we struggle and rebel against God. Acknowledging that we do wrong. But there's one who's done everything right. And He begs you to come. He begs you to be saved. He's paved the way so that you can come to be with Him forever. He says, The one who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned. So why not come then today? Why not come then now? turning away from sin, turning to your Savior. Come through faith as together we stand and sing.
have just a few announcements before we close our services this morning. Uh, we want to continue to remember uh, Jimmy Wayne Robertson, the father of Nathan Robertson. He's recovering at home after a stay in the ICU in Corinth. So let's continue to keep praying for him and his recovery. Um, learned this morning that Mary Lou Elder is in the local hospital. Not, not, we don't have any other details at this moment other than we know she's a, a patient at the Tip County Hospital. So we want to keep Mary Lou in our prayers as well. Also, uh, please remember Diana Wall and her family in your prayers. She is the, on a respirator in ICU at West Jefferson Medical Center in Louisiana. She's the stepmother to Ryan and Landon Walt, who are the grandsons of Miss Johnny Jumper. So the family is leveling by her, lovingly by her side as, this morning. So let's keep this family in your prayer as well. Uh, tonight after services, the youth group invasion will be at the home of Michael and Allison Harrison. That'll be at 6 o'clock uh, for fellowship and food after the services tonight. We want to uh, congratulate Kadarius and Megan Jones. They were married last week, and I do have a card from them to read this morning. Dear church family, we would like to thank everyone for each text message, phone call, and thoughtful gift. And the thoughtful gifts. We're also, we all appreciate all of the encouraging advice. We're excited about our new adventure as husband and wife, and we are so thankful that we have a very loving and supportive family and church family. Once again, once again, we appreciate you all. Love, Kadarius and Megan Jones. I have a card here to read from Regina and Billy Morton. Words are inadequate to thank you for the outpouring of love, to, the love shown to me during my recent surgeries. The food, flowers, cards, words of encouragement, and prayers were greatly appreciated. Continue to keep me in your prayers during my recovery. In Christian love, Regina and Billy Morton. I have another card to read uh, from Zach and Libby Crum. It says, Dear Church Family, there are not enough words to fully express the, our heartfelt thanks and beautiful lantern, sympathy, love, and support you, gave, you have extended to Zach and I during the loss of his grandmother. In Christian love, Zach and Libby Crumb. I believe that's all of the announcements. Does anyone have anything else that needs to be announced at this time? Um, following our closing song, our closing prayer will be by Matt Hopkins. We'd like to invite everyone back this afternoon at 5 p.m. for our afternoon worship service. Uh, we want to thank again all the visitors that are visiting with us today. We invite you back at any time that you're in our area or able to worship with us. Uh, just going over, making sure that's all our notes. I believe that's it. We'll turn the services back over to Josh and the closing prayer to follow by Matt Hopkins. If you will, please stand. We'll sing this uh, servant song one time, and then we'll be led in our dismissal prayer. <clears throat>